well. How are you today? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm doing really good. I'm really, really excited to talk to you today, honestly. Oh, wonderful. I'm always glad to hear that. I, um, I have my copy of The Magic Fix right here. It's stunning. I'm so happy I got the hardcover because Under the Dust Jacket is literally like glorious. I yeah, it's one of my favorite illustrations. I love that one. Um, so I just wanted to congratulate you on your new novel. And actually, it's the, I guess, one month anniversary of its release. Um, yeah, yes, it is. <laughs> um, how does it feel to have your book out in the world now? And as someone who um, says that they spend a lot of time in the library, how does it feel knowing now that children might stumble into a library and pick up your book and kind of connect with their parents in a way that Tian does with his mother? I think it's, I mean, it feels really, really wonderful, frankly. I um, haven't been able to go to the library in a while because most of the local libraries here are, are closed. Um, and so it's kind of a strange time to have my book in the library. I feel like you know, you can't really stumble into books on accident right now. You kind of have to really know what you're looking for. But um, in spite of that, I, I feel like it's been pretty warmly received and I'm really glad that it's out in the world and that people have an opportunity to run into it wherever they are. So I'm, I'm really happy about that. Um, I also wanted to ask you about the name Trungles. Um, mm -hmm. Really sweet, like handle, I guess. I just wanted to ask you where that nickname came from. Oh, uh, <laughs> when I was in high school, I was uh, I was really bad at public speaking, and so I joined the speech team um, at some point to solve that problem. And I won something at some point, and the speaker smushed my first name and my middle name together into one word and called me Trungle in front of the whole auditorium. And I didn't dislike it. I was like, okay, this is who I am now, so I'm just gonna embrace it. And I just added the S because I wanted to be all of the Trungles. <laughs> um, so. After reading The Magic Fish, I was really just in awe. I was sobbing. I was in love with the artwork. And um, as someone who wants to be a graphic novelist like you, I wanted to know where did the, I guess, story originate? And did it change at all when you were developing it? Yeah, it changed a lot. I originally wanted to just tell uh, just do graphic novel uh, adaptations of uh, fairy tales that I grew up with and it was going to be really straightforward but I couldn't decide which one I wanted to do and so I had three different projects kind of floating around in my head and they were all art projects they were not geared toward being books just yet um, but then I realized that they kind of all had really similar themes of transition of longing of yearning and of going from one place to another so I thought that um, I could tie them a little bit more closely together with a more personal narrative. And I'm not someone who's really used to telling long form stories. I think the longest thing that I've ever written is like an essay. And so I thought of The Magic Fish more of uh, more like an essay than a comic book. And uh, that really helped me kind of tie themes and theses together to kind of have a more cohesive um, narrative element kind of wrap around this story within a story format. Um, seeing as this is a story that deals with how stories can resonate across cultures and language barriers, is there a particular tale that spoke to you as a child that you saw yourself in that kind of, like the magic fish will do for readers, that helped you deal with a particular issue you had growing up? Um, well, I think actually it was The Little Mermaid was the first fairy story, like the first fictional story that I really gravitated to as a kid. Um, I was kind of aware of the Disney movie, but I didn't watch that until I think I was like 10 or 11. And I loved The Little Mermaid ever since I was like seven or eight. <laughs> and so I, um, I don't know, I, it was difficult for me to describe at the time, probably why that story resonated so much with me. And I think it was just that the author was really trying to convey this sense of longing for something that he couldn't quite describe or he couldn't quite communicate. Um, and I really was drawn to the notion of, um, of sacrifice, of kind of uh, giving up your agency in order to be someplace where you really want to be. And that really, especially like as a queer person, as an immigrant and as a person of color, like 
the notion of giving up your tongue in order to be someplace else was something that kind of spoke directly to me as a kid because I never felt like I was being fully heard or fully understood and I kind of had to play along wherever it was that I found myself because kind of being in between two cultures you kind of have this sense of like okay I don't quite belong here and I don't quite belong there but if I play my cards right and if I know what the script is then maybe I can pretend for long enough for it to be comfortable and I really took refuge in that story as a kid because it helped me sit in my feelings it helped me feel like sadness isn't something that needs to be resolved right away. And sometimes it's just something that you live with and it's not necessarily something that needs to, um, that needs to dominate your life, but it's, it's certainly a part of it. Definitely. I, I think the idea of belonging is so integrated in, um, you know, queerness and um, immigrant stories and like immigrant life that when I came across this book, I was so, I guess, inspired even because so many times I feel like there's like one immigrant story and it gets told over and over again. And I'm just like, but there's, there's more to people than that. Um, and coming from, you know, immigrant parents, I, I don't know, I just love this book so much. And um, I just finished a book that dealt with the kind of Little Mermaid story as well, but in a different way. And I feel like when authors touch on fairy tales and they kind of spin it in a way that you do, it it brings new light to them and I just really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, there's um, themes of great loss, queerness, immigration, and xenophobia in the case of teen school intruding on his life. When it comes to this part of the book which admittedly made me cry like a baby um was there a portion you knew that there was that this was going to be a part of the story um uh I originally failed to anticipate that the story was going to be very heavy <laughs> I I came in and I was just like I'm going to have a great time and I'm just going to draw fairy tales because that's the story that I love and maybe I'll make the main character somebody that you know young readers can really relate to and it'll be great and it'll be fine and then I realized you know when you talk about immigration and when you talk about queerness especially like with the story it's kind of a period piece that takes place in 1998 and the sort of like the complete lack of agency is really harrowing for a kid. And I think that was one of the things that I, I really wanted to get across like within the context of like an immigrant family and within the context of the time and the language barriers. Like that was, that was something that I, you know, knew in my head, like intellectually, like this is sometimes a difficult topic. And I was really wanting to tell the story from the perspective of the characters and not feel any pressure to like educate or edify an audience about like, this is what like an immigrant story is, or this is what a queer narrative looks like. I just wanted to tell a story about a queer boy and his family. And so, you know, when those themes kind of pop up, it, it always, it surprised me and I didn't quite know how to sit with it at the time. And so I just kind of kept powering through and addressed things as they came along. I think as, um, like if you're any any variety of like a marginalized creator whatsoever, like your story is your story. There are things that happen to you and you know, they happen to you at eye level. And so you're not intellectualizing things all of the time. They just happen to be the things that you go through and will resonate with you over the course of your life. And so as I started to kind of go back over and run over those experiences again, um, I kind of had to really feel them. And that that always was a bit of a surprise for me. Was there any point that you felt you had to like kind of stop what you were doing because the kind of resurgence of emotions was like weighing too heavy on you at point? Yeah, a lot actually. <laughs> I think especially like towards the middle of the book, like whenever um, once the kind of central, it's not really a conflict, but let's call it that for the sake of the narrative. But once the central conflict really rears itself up when Tian kind of, has to decide whether or not he wants to like divulge things to his mother because there's always this tension between different kinds of trauma like especially if you're like if you're an, in an immigrant family and you come from two different perspectives like you grew up in one culture and your parents grew up in another one there is this assumption that you know you you sort of understand that your parents just don't know what they don't know and so you know there's this understanding that you don't 
like you can't expect them to be there for you in all of the ways that you want them to be. And so Tien has that, that experience where he's like, I don't know if my mom can handle this right now because she has a lot going on and I have a lot going on and I can't help her. And I don't think that she can help me with this because we don't even know the words to express this to each other. So all that we can really do is sort of just sit with each other and be there for each other however we can. And I think, and that was something that I completely forgot was such a central part of my experience growing up where I was like, oh yeah, like I remember moments where I just didn't communicate with my parents to the fullness that I really wanted to because I didn't want them to be overwhelmed with, you know, making a new life for themselves while also trying to figure out my problems. And so that was, that was the part where I was like, oh no, I need to take a break. <laughs> um, I'm glad that you, integrated all this because I feel like um, you say that you wanted to tell a small story about a mother and her son, but I think by having it so close in it, it really um, touches people like myself who kind of had that kind of barrier between themselves and like the kind of intergenerational, like not trauma, but like issues of mm -hmm. communication because I feel like any marginalized group has that culture where it's like we don't know how to communicate with our parents mm -hmm. and we're always working through it even into our adulthood yeah I just love that so much and I live I absolutely live for complex parent-child relationships <laughs> so having the intergenerational connections a really broken connection between Tian, Helen and her mother was truly gripping um, you mentioned in your author's note how um, you wanted to tell um, a story about, you know, immigration and not having them be the kind of archetypal, just switch in and out type of story. Um, and I really appreciate that. But I think by having um, this story be so nuanced, you, you carry it into are today, even though it's set in the 90s and the 50s, and even in like times we can't fully um, pinpoint with the fairy tales. Um, so at what age did you know you loved art? At what points did your um, art develop to what it is today? Um, well, I've always loved uh, drawing, and that was something that I always I, I did a lot when I was a little kid, but I never considered it to be a career for most of my life. I've only really been doing this for the past like five or six years, really, and with um, and probably only the last ooh, four years with like any degree of seriousness. Um, you know, when you're kind of like, when you're first gen, you're like, okay, I need to be responsible and I need to do something that, you know, where I can support myself and, you know, my family doesn't have to worry about me. Um, so I went to school, like I studied oil painting at a liberal arts university in art history so that I could like get a professional job and also like work on this thing that I'm really passionate about. And I don't paint anymore, but it was a like, it was a thing that I really tried to pursue wherever I could in any formal av avenues that I could growing up. Um, my art classes were super limited. Like I think I exhausted the curriculum in my high school by the time I was a sophomore. So like I, there just wasn't a lot of resources for me. So I'm largely self-taught. Um, and I didn't think that I was going to be doing comics uh, at all for most of my life. Like it was a fun thing and I liked kind of playing around with it because I liked storytelling, but I didn't think that it was going to be a job that a person could have <laughs> um, or that I could have because I needed to, you know, be really practical. Um, so when I was in college, um, I've told the story, I think in another interview, but I was an intern at the Minnesota Historical Society for a while because I really wanted to get into history and I wanted to utilize my art history um, degree. And I, so, <laughs> so I, I was real excited to get this inter internship because it, it was like my dream job. Like I, if I like interned here, I could go on to do other things. I could do gallery management. I could like do stuff that I was really excited about doing. And then the, the government shut down that summer because <laughs> there was a budgeting dispute um, between the uh, Democratic Farmer Labor Party and the Republicans. And so there was this, and so the government shut down for a, a couple months and I was considered non-essential personnel because I was just an intern. And so I was just out of an internship for the summer and I had to figure out what to do. And while I was figuring out what to do, I just started drawing comics to like kind of 
while away the time <laughs> and posting them on the internet. And that process kind of wound up getting me a little bit of attention. And then I started getting comic jobs and I was like, okay, I guess this is what I do now. <laughs> I think there's something really um, inspiring about having people um, like yourself and other authors that I've talked to that kind of come to writing, kind of come to storytelling, because like, I think there's like a narrative that if you want to be a writer, you have to do it early. If you want to be an artist, you have to be drawing at five years old. But like, I think with your art, which is stunning, um, you can you see that people can come to it kind of later on and really hone in on it and it can be beautiful and you can be successful like yourself. Um, so of the projects you've done in the past, including work for Oni Press, Boom Studios, and Image Comics, which are you most proud of and what goals you have moving forward when it comes to your career? Um, the works that I'm most proud of, so there are two writers that I loved working with. Um, so Marguerite Bennett and Alex DeCampi are two writers that I've worked with before. Um, and we've only done a couple of projects together, but I really, really enjoyed that process. And they're writers who really appreciate that sometimes like an artist is not always appropriate for like certain projects. And so I would not be somebody that you would go to if you wanted like a superhero story, but if you wanted like a fairy tale or something that's told in like a storybook kind of way, like if if you're if that's what the project is, then you know who to go to. And so I really appreciated that. Um, it got me uh, to really kind of embrace the notion that um, different artists have different aesthetic priorities. And so they like the things that they can do will not necessarily always be the things that, you know, people want them to do. And so I, because I didn't think I was going to be doing comics, I um, had the opportunity to say no to a lot of other projects and I had a day job on the side. So I didn't, well, not on the side, that was my main thing. <laughs> and comics were sort of on the side, but um, I was really lucky in that I got to collaborate with people who knew what I was about and knew what I was appropriate for. And so, I, it helped me get a sense for what I wanted to do in the future. And I think, um, and those are projects I'm really proud of. And I think right now I really am looking forward to continuing to tell stories that, you know, that I can, you know, write <laughs> because that's not something that I'm really used to. I'm still kind of figuring out how to pull, pull a script together, but I'm really looking forward to just the, um, the idea that I can, I can tell a story like all by myself. I can do the writing and I can do the research and I can do you know, the drafting and just everything. I like having that total control over my own projects. I love that because I'm someone who absolutely loves working on a team and I want to work on a team and like collaborate with different artists and writers, but there's something about completing something for yourself by yourself that is so relieving and I love that so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really gratifying to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Did you know that you wanted to include, um, because you love fairy tales so much, that you wanted to include Cinderella and the Little Mermaid specifically into the story or were there others you considered? Um, I definitely wanted those. I wanted th to tell more fairy tales within the book actually. Um, and I had budgeted out to do a book that was like the, I think the book is around 230-ish pages, if I'm remembering right. I can't even remember the number of pages I drew for this book. <laughs> but I had budgeted out for like a little over 300, and I realized that I was still figuring out the process, and I couldn't do that and hit all of my deadlines and be able to put that book out in time. So there are stories that I wasn't able to explore, but The Little Mermaid and um, the two Cinderella stories were things that were high priority for me in terms of making sure that the narrative elements gelled really well. Um, and so I had to focus on the themes that were present in, in those stories and kind of comparing them and um, giving the reader a sense that the stories kind of have a lineage and that they look different from place to place and kind of drawing similarities between archetypes. Because there's a thing that happens in fairy tales called um, kind of flatness where they don't really have a psychology. They don't have um, internal motivations outside of their archetype, like archetypical roles. Um, and so, being able to tell those stories side by side and to be able to connect them to characters with a deeper psychology is something that I really wanted to be able to explore. And those were the stories that best suited that kind of thematic need. So that's, that's, those are the ones that I focused on. Kind of going back to 
um, your past projects, were, were there, was there anything in this book or in your past that kind of pushed you out of your comfort zone in terms of art style or storytelling? Yes, actually. Um, so uh, in my author's note, I talk a lot about like uh, what a visual vocabulary is and how each of the characters has a different visual perspective. And that's something that I spent a lot of time interrogating um, while I was kind of making comics for fun. Because what I realized is that a lot of the a lot of my visual assumptions, a lot of the ways that I assume that things look the way that they do kind of come from pop culture in ways that either are not in like not super um, rooted in reality or history. And that's not something that's necessary all the time. Like I think you can make things up and be really free with the ways that you create things, but um, it got me to pay attention to kind of source material a little bit more intentionally. And I think learning um, art history really helped me kind of stoke that sense of curiosity about where images come from. And so doing the research about like why we think that princess dresses look the way that they do or um, what uh, Vietnam looked like in the 50s before the war and like what clothes people wore and what clothes can say about a person's status or about their um, aesthetic inclinations or about their politics even. Those were all things that I had to kind of look into and be really intentional about within this book. And it was, it was a lot of fun to research, but it was really challenging to go through and make sure that I had like a, a stronger grasp on what all of these things meant within the context of the book and within the context of history. I, I think that your um, kind of attention to detail is very, very, um, I forgot the word, it's very like in your face, like you, I know that you paid attention to everything because from the costuming to how the characters um, are kind of postured to the colors, I think each point is very important. And I just love that you um, employed those three colors to kind of differentiate the um, stories and then Helen's story and then Tian's kind of perspective. Um, so was this always the case that you wanted to do this or was there a time when the graphic novel was in full color? Um, there was never a time when the graphic novel was in full color because I'm not a person who's very good at coloring. Um, it's, it's, it just wasn't a skill that I had when I came in to do this graphic novel. And I didn't feel like I was well-versed enough in my own process to pull on a, a colorist to work on it. And so I, I had the help of a, a flatter um, Robin Faisal who did a really fantastic job of making sure that everything, like I could color things efficiently. The color palettes were an invention that was um, uh, encouraged by my editors because they were like, you need to come up with some kind of visual cue to let readers know which story universe they're, they're reading right now. And so I had to think, okay, well, the present, the past, and the fairy tales, those all need to be visually distinct. And so having different colors uh, for each of those story universes helps the reader pick up on where what, what it is that they're reading so that I don't have to identify that with text boxes every time because that would get really, really clumsy and clunky. I think there's something so fantastic about your storytelling because there's not a lot of dialogue because of that language barrier and because a lot of it is said through the imagery. And I was wondering, um, were, are you someone who uses kind of like um, different, um, I forgot the word, uh, when you're like, you take a picture, references different references for your um, artwork or are you someone who kind of pulls it from your own mind? Um, it depends. If I need to, like if I need to do something where I need the characters to exist in a space that's kind of specific, I need to pull from references. Because if you're, like if I'm trying to be really specific about uh, like, a, like a set of clothing or like the, the background, I really need to be intentional about what I'm looking at so that I can give the readers a stronger sense of place and space. Um, so I use references pretty frequently. Um, so I'll have like a folder or like a Pinterest folder full of like, okay, so these are um, buildings and these are streets and these are clothes. Like I have to have different things that I can pull from because relying on your imagination like can only get you so far. And it, give, it gives the reader sort of an incomplete picture of the, the narrative gist that you're trying to get across. Definitely. I have literally like folders of just like feet 
and hands and <laughs> and it's just like anybody who looks through kind of like my folders are like why why do you have so many different hand poses it's like you it's just an artist thing hands are really hard so it's just something you have to do um so as someone who loves storytelling and kind of fairy tales and artwork is there um a particular property that you would like to take that if you could take in your own hands um that you would kind of develop on your own um i think like I really like the Pradane Chronicles, um, which is kind of based on Welsh mythology and the Mabinogian. So I, so maybe that, but I don't know. I, I don't know that there are a whole lot of different properties where I feel like this is really appropriate for my visual style. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think I would have to say probably Lloyd Alexander's Pradane Chronicles and I haven't thought much further than that. Th those are like the only books where I was like, I think this could make a really fun comic and I would have fun drawing it. Valid. Um, were there, are there any artists whose styles you pulled inspiration from in developing your own style? Yeah, absolutely. I, when I was in college, I studied a lot of, my art history professor was great. And she, I talked to her about like, okay, I'm not super interested in like gallery arts. I really want to study ephemera and I like advertisement and I like things that are sort of temporary and I like illustration. And she was like, okay, so you can look into these resources. And so I got a, a really great chance to look at um, uh, children's book illustrations at the turn of the century and its relationship to book publishing and printing um, and the technology that it took to make books at the time. So there used to be a much closer relationship between art galleries and um, gift books. It was like a really fancy, like color printing was really, really fancy. And so they wanted artists to um, do illustrations that were really lavish and they would print these really expensive books that were not really meant to be like read to pieces. They're sort of meant to be like these beautiful um, things that you would like give to each other. And so a lot of the artists that I looked at kind of worked within that mold. And so my favorite artists were um, Edmund Dulock and Arthur Rackham. I really liked the work of Rose O'Neill. She invented the Cupies, but she also did a lot of really stunning and kind of dark science fiction looking or like fantasy looking illustrations as well. Um, who else do I love? Harry Clark and uh, oof, Kai Nielsen is also a really huge influence. So yeah, just like a lot of turn of the century illustration. Um, you mentioned that you looked into children's books. As a graphic novelist, do you ever see yourself publishing a traditional novel in prose or even working alongside another author or illustrator? Um, and if so, are there any people in particular you would like? Oof, that's not something that I've ever thought about. <laughs> so I don't know who my potential collaborators would be. I don't really have like a dream collaboration, but I would be super enthusiastic about the idea if the right person were to approach me. Um, uh, yeah, and I have thought about doing children's books at some point, but I, I don't know that my, uh, the way that I draw is super appropriate for a lot of children's books. I think um, middle grade and young adult is kind of where my um, visual style is most appropriate. And so that's kind of where I, I like to stick, but I don't know. Yeah, I would be super open to kind of doing different things. But one of the things that I would have to consider is that like, you know, making an illustrated book is a, a very different and you know, uh, process than making a comic book. And it requires a slightly different skill set. And I would have to build those skills before I could be confident in, you know, pitching a book that a publisher would be able to publish. So there are just a lot of like little nuances and professional considerations that I had never thought of before. I had to go out and actually make a book and think about like, okay, where do I fit in in this larger economy of bookmaking? I think your illustrative work is spectacular. Like, I really just want to see it everywhere on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It has incredible detail and fine tune um, lines, which are so hard to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> all that said, would you consider yourself a fast worker or how long would you say it took you to draw everything um, that is now the complete book? Um, well, I used to consider myself pretty fast. Um, because I knew exactly what it was that I was doing. And so I can draw pretty efficiently. I can compose a page pretty efficiently. 
the things that um, slowed me down a little bit were sort of the technical aspects of it. And so like, I'm used to drawing much shorter projects. I think the longest thing before this was 20 pages long. And so that was really easy for me to sort of bang out in a few weeks and work with another person. So I didn't have to write it either. Um, and so being able to draw, I could just say like, yeah, I'm a pretty fast person when it comes to just the drawing. But um, when you're doing like a graphic novel that's over 200 pages, the process of like, drawing traditionally and then you you know you do the pencils you do the inks you wait for it to dry you clean it up and you have to scan it and then you have to format it before you can start you know coloring it and getting it ready to be printed that process really adds up every step so i had to figure out a way to do that um, a little bit more efficiently and so at the moment i think i'm someone who's like whose drawing skills are like like fine for what I want, uh, for what I want to be doing in the stories that I want to tell. But there are like technical things that I still have to learn. Like I had to learn how to draw digitally and I had to learn how to format things that, um, to make it appropriate for the designer to work on the book. And uh, yeah, they're just like a lot of little things that I'm still kind of picking up along the way. And so right now I would not consider myself to be a fast person at making comic books, even though I have always been someone who draws fairly efficiently. There are just so many other things to think about and consider that, you know that I had to learn and that and learning takes time absolutely I feel like um with the book it just it, I can tell that it took a long time and when I was reading kind of like the first few pages I was interested to know um what is your preferred medium to work in and was it difficult to sort of make sure the digital imagery matched what you already completed traditionally Mm, yes, that was so hard. <laughs> I think, I mean, like I, I am used to working traditionally mostly. And so that's where my comfort zone has always been. And I'm starting to get much more comfortable digitally because it's just so much faster because you, you know, when you're done drawing, you're just done drawing and you can save the file and you're all done. But if you're doing, you know, work traditionally, you have to do so much preparation and, you know, file formatting and stuff like that. And so like, if it comes to like just the drawing portion of it, like I prefer working on paper. I think most artists would prefer working um, traditionally, but I, I find that the cleanliness and not having to worry about my workspace and just being able to save things efficiently. If I'm making a book that's different than I'm making, you know, like a series of art objects. And so I don't have to be precious about making things traditionally um, if I'm working in that mode. And so uh, it just depends on what I'm trying to do. If I want to, you know, do you know, a series of illustrations, I think I would prefer to work traditionally. But if I'm, you know, making a book, something long form, something that requires lots and lots and lots of pages, I would much prefer to work digitally just because it's so much more convenient to that end. Um, yeah. And, and it was really difficult for me to learn how to draw digitally because I drew the first two thirds of the book traditionally before I realized that I, there's no way I would be able to hit my deadlines <laughs> if I continued doing that process. And so I switched over to a digital format and I had to spend like two weeks making sure that all of the like brushes were set right and that I could adjust things to make it hue as closely as possible to the tra traditional work. And the other difficulty was that there's a little, you know, there's a little lag and there's a little space between the glass and, you know, your pen. And so trying to articulate the really fine lines that I can do really easily traditionally onto a digital format was really challenging. But I got the hang of it eventually. It just took some practice. Something that I love about doing digital art is that when you're drafting, you can just hit a button and then, oh, whatever I erase comes back or you can readjust the size easier than like a traditional piece. So I think the best thing about um, kind of switching between digital art and traditional is you can work between the two and like when you create something digitally or traditionally and you kind of meld them, it really, be it really becomes something like wholly unique. And this is definitely one of those things. No, oh, thank you. So when composing the story, who was the first person you shared it with? Um, I shared it with, um, I shared it with one writer friend and then I just never <laughs> asked for any feedback outside of my editors <laughs> because I'm like, okay, well, I have people, you know, who, whose job it is to like look at the story and give me feedback. So I'm just not going to show it to anybody else. <laughs> So I didn't really, I didn't share the story with, you know, people that I knew or any of my peers and colleagues, really. I just worked with my editors and I really liked that process because then I didn't have to be like, 
you know, like if you're making something that a lot of people are going to read, you're going to want the process to be, or you, you're going to want to present your, you know, your best, your best possible product. You want to put your best foot forward. And so I was really like, okay, I'm not going to show this to anybody until it's like done, done. And it was like, even a little embarrassing to even work with my editors. Cause I'm like, I'm sorry, this isn't perfect. Like right away. <laughs> but you know, I, yeah, I didn't wind up sharing it with a whole ton of people outside of my editors. When you did share it with your family, what was the response? Um, well, uh, it was pretty positive, but like my parents are not used to reading comic books. And so I don't think that they would know how to, like that's, that's one thing that surprises me because I sort of take comic books for granted. Like a lot of us grew up reading it and it's really easy to pick up on the kind of visual patterns and the kind of visual grammar that goes along with reading a, you know, a series of panels. But for some people, it's just not something that they learned how to do. And so I don't know that they've actually read it. I feel like with parents, it's just like you can give them your thing that you worked on for so long. And it's just like, whoo, great. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, that's the best you can hope for, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's sort of like, there are so many little milestones that you kind of understand, like, is a big deal because you're like, oh, okay, like, this is a thing that I recognize within my industry. But then, like, even with people who, like, aren't your parents, even with people just outside of the comic book bubble or, like, or whatever, it's hard to explain to them, like, oh, like, this is a thing that matters a lot in my industry. Like, it's all very context specific. So I think, you know, sharing it with other people, it, it sort of keeps you really humble because they don't really have a concept for, like, you know, any accolades that you could potentially get. Um, and it's also kind of freeing because you sort of, like, don't worry about those things quite as much. So could you talk a little bit about the chicken? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I love them so much, but I was super against the idea of having chickens at the beginning. Um, so uh, they're about a year and a half old and my spouse actually ran the idea by me because they were really interested in getting chickens. And I was like, I didn't know that was a thing that I could do in the city. Um, so apparently you have to take a class and then you have to, you know, get a certificate and then you have to get it okayed by the city to have a chicken coop in your backyard and there can only be so many chickens within such and such amount of space and it has to be a certain number of feet away from any like habitable human, you know, building. So there were just a lot of rules that I didn't know about it. And so I was like, this sounds like a headache. And also I'm not an animal person. Like I'm someone who does not like anything with its own personality or its own intestinal tract. Like if I have to pick up its poop, I don't like it. <laughs> and so I was super against the idea of getting chickens, but then we pick them up because the hatchery will send them to a central location. And ours was like a chicken supply store. And we went and we picked them up and we got three of them. And we, you know, took them home in like a little box and we had stuff prepared for them. And they started like playing with each other and like cheeping at each other. And I was just so, <laughs> I completely fell in love with them. It was super embarrassing because like there was a moment where I was like, these are now my children and I'm going to take care of them for their entire <laughs> Um, but it's just been a joy, like kind of seeing them grow up and, you know, they've been laying eggs for a little while and they're molting for the first time and they have all kinds of little milestones that I get to be really excited about. So I get, I like, I like hanging out with them and I can see the chicken coop like directly outside of my office. So it's, it's always a lot of fun to kind of look over and look at them kind of, you know, doing their thing and taking their dust baths and, you know, yelling at each other like chickens do. Um, I know you said that um, you're not sure when you'll do ch um, children's books, but do you ever think that there's one day you will write a picture book about your chickens and all their <laughs> <laughs> Oh, probably, probably, definitely. I'll start working on that right away. <laughs> it would be fun. It would be cute. And it would be something that I would really love to do. They have such distinct personalities. I'm sure I could spin a story about them. <laughs> I would love that. I, I just love the idea of the chickens and like how like integral they are to like your life and like comfort and just I love that so much. Um, so I've read that the magic fish is a standalone and that you want to tell, tell a story next that is much different in tone. Um, where are you at in your next project? Is there anything you can share? 
Um, I don't know what I can or can't share about it, actually. I don't think I have like any kind of NDA because it's like, it's my, it's my project. I don't have to like, <laughs> I don't have to keep anything a secret really. But my next book is um, just going to be, uh, it's going to be a pretty straightforward, like teen romantic comedy. So it's going to be, the characters will be a little bit older than teen. Um, there will still be a lot of like kind of family themes and there is going to be a fairy tale reference in it, but I don't know how explicit I want to make it, um, that reference. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited about it. It's, uh, it's about a girl who is in high school and she likes to keep herself really, really busy um, in order to not deal with any of her feelings. <laughs> and so she's overcommitted and always busy and she has to figure out a way to make time for her friends and make time for her family so that she um, has a, an opportunity to develop meaningful relationships outside of just, you know, striving for her academic goals. So that's, that's my next project. I'm really excited about it because I really, <laughs> this the magic fish wound up being so much more emotionally hefty than I thought it was going to be. And I just really wanted to spend a lot of time in a place where, you know, I could experience just a lot of joy and a lot of fun. And so I just wanted to do a book that was, you know, that was straightforwardly fun. I am so excited. I love when authors are discussing their next projects because you could just see like in your face how excited you are. And it's always so exciting to hear um, what's coming in the pipeline. Um, so do you ever picture yourself um, kind of manifesting your own kind of fairy tale story? Um, I mean, I, I do. And I think like in a way I'm doing a lot of that already, but the thing that I really enjoy about fairy tales is that they are like, they're constantly reiterated um, and they exist in so many different formats and so many different um, just iterations that I, I don't really have a sense that I'm trying to do that on purpose. Like, I think if I'm going to do uh, a fairy story, like I don't really have a lot of problems referencing something that came before me because that's sort of what makes fairy tales special is that they have a lineage and that you can go backwards and you can figure out which stories kind of come from what places. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not a stickler for novelty and uh, fairy tales are such a rich space from which to draw any kinds of stories that whatever I do with it, I'm gonna be happy with. I love that. Um, as a closing question and considering the time of year, um, what is your favorite holiday tradition and is there any holiday story that you have that you always have to read, watch, or listen to? Mm, oh my gosh, it's gonna be a long list because I love the holidays. <laughs> I um, am someone who you know really likes kind of the very sentimentalized sort of um, almost corporatized holiday traditions in the US. And so I have a huge list of movies that I watch every single year starting kind of in the middle of November. So right now, um, all the way up until uh, New Year's. And so I'll watch uh, I have like the whole collection of Rankin Bass animated, like the stop motion animation Christmas movies. And so I'm going to go through and watch all of those. And then I'm going to watch all of the Garfield Christmas specials and then all of the Peanuts ones. And then I'll start watching kind of the bigger long form movies like um, White Christmas is always a fun one. Um, gosh, what else? There are all kinds of like new holiday movies coming out too. Um, so there are some on Netflix that I still haven't seen. I recently incorporated Rise of the Guardians into the Christmas movie pantheon for me because it's such a fun movie and I feel like it underperformed but it's so unfortunate because it was so beautifully put together and it was just done so well so yeah I have a huge list of like of Christmas things that I'm going to get through. Um, have you seen Klaus on Netflix? I have yes it's so beautiful I love it. Yeah I think that has kind of melded into my traditions and I definitely can't wait to watch it this year as well as I think the movie's called like Jingle 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 Jangle um yeah I saw previews for that it looks so cute I just love I love campy Christmas movies so much and what is that one with like Kurt Russell as Santa Claus I haven't seen that one yet but I'm really looking forward to it I can't wait um speaking of holidays um would you ever write a holiday story yeah, that's my next one, actually. <laughs> God, I am so excited. Like, yeah. I can read holiday stories throughout the year because I love holidays so much. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so happy to hear that. Yes, yeah. I didn't want to mention it before, but like the, the story takes place in the wintertime. And so a lot of the story happens 
around a holiday craft fair. So I get to draw like a lot of like kitschy Christmas decorations and like puts Christmas villages and stuff like that. I love that so much. Is there any um, graphic novels that you love and want to recommend? Um, the Best That We Can Do by T. Bui was one of my favorite reads when that book came out. It was the first specifically a Vietnamese American story that I had ever read in graphic novel format. And so I was just really blown away that this was a possibility for me. And so I think that was really like, that was a strong um, uh, kind of impetus for me to tell my own story. Like, it, like my story and that book are like very dissimilar and they're sort of told from perspectives that I think are fairly disparate, even though they are kind of centered around family, but that was a book that really inspired me to get really personal with uh, a story. And so I, I recommend that book to everyone. Um, the last graphic novel that I read that I just loved bits was um, <laughs> Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me by Mariko Tamaki and Rosemary Valero O'Connell. It is so beautiful. It's so wonderful. And I just love the way that both of them work. Um, Mariko Tamaki is such a wonderful writer and the way that she writes is something that I really aspire to. Like it's both deeply um, relatable, but also just incredibly insightful, the ways that she writes about relationships and values and like how to, you know, have honest exchanges between you and the people that you care about, like the way that she writes is wonderful. And of course, um, Rosemary Valero O'Connell's artwork is just the most stunning. Like I think she has to be consistently my favorite graphic novel artist outside of like maybe like Tilly Walden is another one that I think of um, in terms of just really beautiful um, graphic novels. Oh, and then I would recommend Tilly Walden's books to everyone as well. Um, oh my gosh, this list is gonna be so long. Kiku Hughes recently put out a graphic novel called, um, what is it, Displacement? It's about um, the Japanese internment camps and it's really beautifully told as well. Um, and then just for fun, like a fantasy series that I really enjoy uh, is called Gesh, spelled G-E-I-S by um, Alexis Deacon. Yeah, and I think that rounds out my list of graphic novels for now, but there's so many more that I love and would recommend to people. I love talking book recs with um, authors and just people in general because it just opens up like, I love, I will read literally everything you just told me because it just opens up the world to me. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love um, Tilly Walden. And um, I wanted to ask you if you've read um, Angel Love. I, that is probably one of my favorite graphic novels. Say that again. Bingo Love. I don't think, oh, Bingo Love. I have not read Bingo Love. It is fantastic. Um, other than the magic fish. Um, it's in my <laughs> Pop graphic novels to recommend um, alongside, I think, Sheets. Um, I'm forgetting the author right now. Um, by Brenna Thumler. It's fantastic. It's about a shy ghost and a girl who has just lost her mother. Oh, yes, I have heard of that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I highly recommend it. Cool, cool. I'll look into those. Um, so yeah, um, thank you for interviewing with me today. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'll make sure to link your socials as well as your website so we can all keep to date on all your future events and book announcements, which I'm so excited for. Um, and yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for chatting with me. I had a nice time. <laughs>